Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to the 10th, the 10th floor of Weiser Hall, um, our first uh, chair installation uh, in this uh, venue. Uh, my name is Andrew Martin. I'm Dean of the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, and I am thrilled to be here today to introduce today's lecturer, Mark Mizrucki, the Robert Cooley Angel Collegiate Professor of Sociology and Barger Family Professor of Organizational Studies. Uh, following the lecture, you are all invited to a re reception um, in the lounge area behind us. Uh, let me start with a few words about the namesake of this professorship. Robert Cooley Angel earned his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Michigan, and by the time of his graduation with his PhD in 1924, he was already an instructor of sociology in the Department of Economics. As a member of a family rich in educators, his distinguished service to the university went far beyond his excellence in the classroom. Professor Angel was an influential member of many societies in the field, including presiding over the American Sociological Association and the International Sociological Society, and through his rather extensive travels, contributed important observations to the growing movement of social cooperation. He was committed to the advancement of rigorous scientific research in sociology. His involvement with the department, his professional commitment, and his personal distinction contributed immensely to the success of sociology here at the University of Michigan. Now I'll turn to today's honoree, Professor Mark Mizrucki. Like his predecessor, Professor Mizrucki has greatly impacted the field of sociology. He received his PhD from the State University of New York at Stony Brook in 1980. After beginning his career at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and then at Columbia University, he joined the University of Michigan faculty in 1991. As one of the top economic sociologists in the world, Mark is a prolific researcher with a focus on the economic and political behavior of large American corporations using the methods of social network analysis. His research has centered on questions of how social structures affect group behavior and how corporate networks influence business political behavior, corporate financial strategies, and administrative control and governance. For the past 30 years, his writing has helped define and move forward the cutting edge of so scholarship on business organizations and social networks. He has helped define our understanding of the nature, evolution, and transformation of the U.S. corporate elite over the past century. Mark has written four books and over 100 articles and reviews, many of which are high profile and were published in both scholarly journals and covered in the news media. His discourse is rigorous and relevant. His work has delved deeply into history and process and has shaped the conversation about corporate influence in today's society. In his latest book, The Fracturing of the American Corporate Elite, he examines the consequences of our corporate history as it reaches beyond business and into the political realm. In addition to being an esteemed author and scholar, Professor Mizrucki is regarded as an outstanding instructor of both undergraduate and graduate students. He teaches a wide range of courses while maintaining a commitment to graduate mentorship. As director of the Organizational Studies Program, he is dedicated to interdisciplinary scholarship that includes theoretical, empirical, and experiential perspectives. The college agrees that based on his high regard and extremely successful career in both scholarship, education, and leadership, that he is most deserving of being named the Robert Cooley Anger Collegiate Professor of Sociology. Please join me in congratulating Professor Mark Mizrucki on your achievements. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I you know, the, the, this decision to name this award after Robert Cooley Angel is something that I took very seriously. I get, did a lot of research on it. I talked to a lot of people. I did a lot of reading. And um, I probably could take the entire time just explaining why I did this. But I just want to tell one small uh, story, one small piece of that. So um, Julie Sparkman, who organized this whole event, and had mentioned to me that maybe we should try to contact the family. And I had been thinking about this for some time, but I had no 
idea how to do this. And so I checked with Terry McDonald, who's our former dean and is now the director of the Bentley Historical Library, who's actually working on a history of the university. And it turned out that Terry knew Bob Angel's daughter, and he had her email address, which he gave to me. Uh, her, her proper name is Sarah, but she goes by Sally. So I thought, okay, so I, I composed an email message and I sent it to her. And, uh, you know, about 15 minutes after I hit the send button, I get a phone call. And I see the number, and, and I could see it was a local number, but I didn't recognize it. And I, f I figured, well, I'll answer it. It was Sally. And you can imagine what a thrill this was. We spent about 25 minutes on the phone, had a fantastic conversation. She told me all about her dad, about her own family. Unfortunately, uh, she had a family event in California this week, and so she's not here. But uh, she's here in spirit, and hopefully she can see this on video. Um, edited, I hope, to get rid of any major blunders that I might make in the next <laughs> 45 minutes. OK, so you know, it would be very easy for me to start out by saying American society is in a crisis. You know, I think most of you would agree. You might not agree on exactly what the crisis are, whether there's just one of them, but you could probably say, yeah, we, can, we could say it's in a crisis. Well, the problem is you could say that about just about any historical period. And in fact, Bob Angel published a book in 1957, Free Society and Moral Crisis. And what was he talking about in the 1950s? Well, you know, there were many people thought we were on the brink of nuclear war. Remember, nuclear weapons were new in those days, and people didn't know what was going to happen with them. We were also in a society with legally sanctioned racism and sexism, widespread poverty. There was a stultifying, what many believed at least was a stultifying pressure toward conformity uh, and intolerance of difference. I'm, I'm going to be saying some very good things about that era, but I just want to make clear it was hardly a utopia. There, there were plenty of problems. But today we're facing a different kind of crisis. And just consider these publications. This is one with, with which many of you are probably familiar, uh, Bob Putnam's Bowling Alone. The Collapse, he says revival of American community, but I think that's more hopeful than... Uh, accurate even in his views. Collapse of American community. Then, you, then we have uh, Daniel Rogers, Age of Fracture. We have Yuval Levin, The Fractured Republic. We have Mizrahi, The Fracturing of the American Corporate Elite. By the way, the publisher gave me that title. That was not my original one. Uh, as you can see, there's some kind of a pattern here maybe. Um, well, it certainly seems that American life has become increasingly fragmented. When I was growing up, long before most of you were born, we used to get our news from Walter Cronkite at 7 p.m. on CBS. And so, you know, some people got it from Huntley and Brinkley, but that was at 6.30 on NBC, so you could actually watch both of them. And there was plenty of turmoil and conflict and disagreement, but we all got our news from the same sources, and we, we at least agreed on what was happening in the world. Today, every one of us individually can basically get our own spe specifically tailored news feed um, tailored to our own particular political perspective. And so things have really become more fragmented. And one aspect of this is that our politics have become very polarized. Um, and where there's polarization, there is extremism. And what we constantly hear in the media is, well, this extremism is happening on both sides. The Republicans have become more extreme. The Democrats have become more extreme. If we actually look at the facts, this is a graph that was prepared by Keith Poole, a political scientist who has a fantastic website. I can't remember what it's called right Vote now. Now. Vote, yeah, now. Vote, yeah, voteview.com. But anyway, you should go on there. And um, I actually reproduced this in my book with his permission. What he's got here is votes in, um, in House, from the House of Representatives from 1879 to the present. Okay, and the top of the scale is more conservative, bottom of the scale is more liberal. And these are the Republicans, these are the Democrats. Now, the solid line here is Democrats as a whole. The broken lines, these are, Dem um, oh no, these are Northern Democrats, these are Democrats as a whole, these are Southern Democrats. Okay, so we see slightly increased liberalism on the Democratic side in recent years. That's because there are fewer and fewer Southern Democrats. That's the entire explanation for that. But if you look just at Northern Democrats, it's almost a horizontal line. There really hasn't been much of a change. If you look at the Republicans, right around 1980, you start to see a kick 
and then look at that. Basically, pretty close to 100% of the variance in our polarization right now can be accounted for by the increasing conservatism of the Republican Party. You may think this is a good thing or a bad thing, but it is a fact. Okay, that's just the way it is. And one of the things I want to do today is try to explain this. So, first thing I'm going to do is point out there have been a number of um, explanations proposed for why we see the increased polarization. So I'm just going to run down a few of them. Some of them are based in psychology, and I love psychology. I have no problem with it. But the idea that, you know, today we lack empathy. Well, okay, I think that may be true, but it's probably more a consequence of the polarization than it is a cause. Um, some people have argued, well, you know, we self-select into like-minded communities, so we only hang out with people who share our views. Again, I suspect that that may be more of a consequence than a cause. Some people have argued it has to do with proliferation of technology. I think there's probably a lot to be said about that. Uh, the fact that we can get so much news now from the Internet, and again, we can read what we want. We, I get a lot of my news from Facebook on the, the, the posts that my friends do, but on the other hand, you know, I actually do have some uh, right-wing friends, so I get a little bit of diversity. Some people have argued it goes back to the late 60s and Richard Nixon's Southern strategy. What I've never been able to figure out about this argument is how the fact that the Southerners became more Republican uh, over time has anything to do with polarization. And you're going to see why I believe that in a couple of minutes. Well, I'm going to suggest that there's something else at work. And I'm going to give you my punchline right now because I only have till 5 o'clock and chances are I won't make it to the end. So I want to make sure you at least know what my argument is. What I'm going to argue is that the basis of today's extremism comes from an unlikely source. That it has to do with a decline in leadership of the group that I call the American corporate elite. These are the heads of the largest American corporations. And I say it's unlikely because most of you probably think this group is pretty self-serving, number one, pretty conservative, number two, and number three, increasingly con extreme, as evidenced by people like the Koch brothers. But I'm going to argue that there was a period from the end of World War II into roughly the mid-1970s when the leaders of American big business were actually a source of moderation in our political system. That they exhibited a concern for the well-being of society. And, you know, again, they certainly had their own interests to protect. But there was something beyond that that they were pushing. And, of course, what I'm going to argue also is that today there's nothing like that. Uh, there are a few individuals here and there uh, whom I'll mention, but th it's a very, the leadership of big business today is very, very different. Today's corporate elite, I'm going to argue, is an atomized, disorganized group, incapable of addressing not only larger societal issues, but even the group's own issues. And the result of this, I'm going to argue, is the political extremism that we observe today. So before getting into this, it's, it's useful to give you a sense of what the political climate was like in the post-World War II period. So let's take a look at the three Republican presidents during that era, starting with Dwight Eisenhower. So what did Eisenhower do? Well, during the Korean War, he instituted an excess profits tax on firms that were profiting from the war. Imagine that. Uh, he increased Social Security payments. He expanded the Social Security program to cover agricultural workers. And at one point, his brother Edgar wrote him a letter and basically said, look, we've been in the wilderness for 20 years with Roosevelt and Truman, and now we finally get a Republican president. Why aren't you getting rid of all this New Deal stuff? And Eisenhower wrote back to his brother, and I've just quoted a few pieces from this, but it's an amazing letter. It's in the Eisenhower archives. You can find it online. Should any political party attempt to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, and eliminate labor laws and farm programs, you would not hear of that party again in our political history. There's a tiny splinter group, of course, that believes you can do those things. Their number is negligible, and they are stupid. <laughs> By the way, he did refer to uh, specific people by name. I've excised that from the quote, but uh, this is an ex okay. So this was the Republican president during the 1950s. Now we come to the late 1960s, early 1970s. We have Richard Nixon, who most of you probably remember just because of the Watergate scandal. But Nixon also instituted the negative income tax for the poor. He is the one who signed into being the Environmental Protection Agency and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. 
He also introduced a health care plan that I'm not going to run through every piece of it. You can see it, but it included, for example, the public option that Obama wanted to have but eventually was scratched in his plan. Nothing in the Clinton or Obama plans was as radical as what Nixon proposed. It was rejected by Ted Kennedy because he was holding out for single payer. Kennedy later said that that was one of the biggest political mistakes of his career. But, and it never happened because of Watergate and Nixon was preoccupied and so was everybody else. But just take a look at this. Again, this is a Republican president introducing this. And then there's our very own Michigan alum, Gerald Ford. So inflation had really spiked in the 1970s by the time Ford became president and nobody knew what to do about it. And he came up with this idea, we're going to have these buttons that say win, whip inflation now. And, and he was widely and probably justifiably ridiculed for that. It was, oh, we're just going to wear buttons and somehow that's going to stop inflation. What very few people realize though at the time or certainly not now is what Ford also proposed in the speech in which he introduced the WIND program. Check this out. Public service employment for 170,000 people. That's the government providing jobs for 170,000 people. Supplemental unemployment for those who exhausted their benefits. A $1.6 billion tax cut only for moderate and low income Americans to be financed by a windfall profits tax on oil companies. Now where would that put him in today's political dialogue? Somewhere slightly to the left of Bernie Sanders maybe? <laughs> this is a Republican president. Now if, if all this isn't enough to convince you that we're living in a very different political environment today, check this out. Medicare was passed in 1965, okay? You know how many Republican votes Obamacare got, right? Zero in the House, zero in the Senate. Check this out. This is the final vote on Medicare. Almost half of the senators, over half of the Republican, these are Republican votes on Medicare, over half of the House members, okay? I hope I've convinced you now that this post-war period was a very different political environment from what we are experiencing today. So what was behind this? Okay, well, there was the, you know, the political, the, the general electorate was certainly more liberal in those days perhaps than it is today. But what I'm going to argue is that what was really behind it was a big business community that was supporting these policies. And so let me clarify what I'm talking about here. Historically, American business from large to small has been what we would consider politically conservative. They have an almost religious belief in free markets. They're against, you know, they want low taxes. They don't like government social programs. They especially don't like labor unions. That has basically always been true of the bulk of American business people. But in the period after World War II, there was a relatively small group of business leaders at the top of the business community that had a very different perspective. And these are people who exercised a considerable amount of power. They sat on the, they were involved in multiple organizations. They sat on the boards of directors of multiple companies. They operated through organizations such as the Committee for Economic Development and the Council on Foreign Relations, among others. And they exhibited a significant amount of power. So the CED, the Committee for Economic Development, by the way, still technically exists, although it was absorbed by another organization called the Conference Board about three years ago. And it's, for all intents and purposes, moribund at this point. But this at one time was a very, very important organization. The CED, for example, was behind the Marshall Plan, which was the economic reconstruction plan for Western Europe. It was behind the Employment Act of 1946, which created the Council of Economic Advisors. They were involved in the more than tenfold expansion in federal aid to education during the 1960s. They also, by the way, were the ones who came up almost verbatim with what became Nixon's health care plan. This was a very important organization. And so they were the epitome of this, but it wasn't just the CED. You could see this in the big business community as a whole um, at that time. And one characteristic of this group is that its attitudes were not these right-wing ones that, are, that are, have predominated in the business community. On the contrary, they had a perspective that I refer to as a, a accommodationist, which is not a word because I get a red underline and 
<laughs> word when I type it in, but it sounds good, right? I mean, it's kind of expresses. They, they, they were accommodating, which is a word. So their views included, they didn't, you know, they didn't love labor unions, but there was a kind of grudging acceptance that labor unions are here to stay. We need to work with them. Um, they accepted a certain degree of government regulation. They were willing to accept certain government social programs to, and, and other kinds of government action to ameliorate the deleterious consequences of the market system. Um, it's important to note they were not liberals. Most of them were Republicans, but they tended to have a more pragmatic approach towards strategy. So in an ideal world, yeah, they would have loved to have gotten rid of labor unions. Sure, let's have a complete free market. Let's get rid of government regulation. But again, they felt that you, we had to deal with the world as it was. And besides, they also understood they, they were Keynesians economically. They believed that for a society to function in that kind of, in those kinds of conditions of advanced capitalism, you had to have a strong foundation. There had to be, people had to have money in their pockets so they could purchase the things that in those days American companies were actually manufacturing. And so they even had a term for this. And so, so they, I guess one way to put it is, they understood you don't kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. These were people who were privileged, but they believed that the, the, their privileges required a strong foundation in the society. So let me give you a couple examples of this. Um, so there's, the CED put out a position paper in 1971 on the social importance of the, of the large corporation. And in this paper, they emphasize the importance of, and this is the term I was referring to, enlightened self-interest. That's what they called it. And it's kind of a good term. They were acknowledging, yeah, yeah, we're out for ourselves. We're trying to protect our privileges. But we're doing it in a kind of enlightened way. We believe that that means we have to be concerned about the larger population. And so this included the idea that corporate well-being is promoted by social well-being. Another thing they did is they stressed the importance of what in those days was called social voluntarism. Today we call it CSR, corporate social responsibility. But you know, they said, yeah, companies should be good citizens. They should give money to, to local causes and, and community organizations and things. But what's, what's critical about this position is they believe that simply doing that alone was not sufficient, that there had to be government policy decisions because otherwise you'd have classic free rider problems, right? Some companies could behave in responsible fashions, others might not, and then they take advantage of the ones that did. So it has to be something that's enforced across the board, so the government has to be involved. And again, these are big business people taking this position. Well, one of my colleagues, when I was first putting this together, said to me, yeah, that was 1971, it was the late 60s, you know, everybody was kind of liberal and progressive in those days. If you went back earlier, you might not find this. It turns out, however, that it, you can. So I have here in my hand, this is a copy of a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal, November 21st, 1956, two weeks after Dwight Eisenhower was reelected to his second term as president. And it's a reproduction of an article from Time Magazine. This is actually an ad for Time Magazine in the Wall Street Journal. And it's an article called The New Conservatism, A Bold Creed for Modern Capitalism. And basically what it's doing is describing the, the, the idea that business, big business at least, has taken on the very attitudes that I have been describing. I'm just going to read a couple of passages here to give you a sense of what we're talking about. Though businessmen fought a long delaying action against the growth of labor unions, against government intervention in economic affairs, against social legislation, the majority now realize that welfare programs help store up purchasing power in the hands of the consumer. Says Gaylord A. Freeman, Jr., vice president of the First National Bank of Chicago, which at the time was one of the leading banks, quote, I think social security is good. I think unions are good. Unemployment compensation is desirable. Social legislation can add to the totality of freedom, increase the dignity of the individual. One more example. Businessmen who once decried government meddling in the economy also recognize that most federal police powers, for example, regulation of the stock market, benefit business as well as the consumer. 
Most businessmen today agree with DuPont Chairman Walter S. Carpenter, Jr. that the antitrust laws, under which his company has been hauled into court 22 times, are fair and should be vigorously enforced. One last quote. Since Standard Oil Company of California President Ted Peterson, that's Chevron, by the way, quote, business should be allowed the right to property, but not the right to destroy. The businessman expects to have government stop him now. Okay, I hope you're convinced that during this period, and I think the, the thing to consider is imagine that we were hearing these attitudes out of the leaders of American big business today. I think you probably wouldn't, you, yeah, there's Warren Buffett, there's George Soros, but you know, this is not exactly m mainstream dominant. As one reviewer of my book put it, the attitudes back then would put them on the left wing of today's Democratic Party. Okay. I just want to reiterate, this is not a majority necessarily of business people, although there actually is of large business people. There was a study by a former colleague of mine, Alan Barton, who interviewed 95 leading uh, Fortune 500 executives and found in 1971, 60% of them agreed with the statement that if the market economy cannot provide sufficient jobs for people, the government should step in and, and fill the gap. Okay? So in other words, over half of top corporate executives in 1971 believe the government should basically guarantee full employment. Okay, so how did this arise? Well, it didn't arise in a vacuum. And what I argue is there were external pressures on business that basically constrained them to hold these positions and act, and act in this way. One was the fact that the government in those days in the United States was relatively strong and active, but it was also highly legitimate. Most of the public thought the government was a good guy. This was a, a legacy of the New Deal. Um, and I remember this growing up. You know, the government would have ads for their programs and they would be proud of them. Today, it's like, you know, anything with government on it is like to be avoided like the plague. So that was one thing they had to deal with. The second thing was, okay, American labor has never been like European labor or even Canadian. But compared to the way it is now, the labor movement was pretty strong and they did exercise a considerable amount of constraint. And finally, I argue that the financial community played a moderating and integrating role. These were the centers where the heads of, uh, the chief executives of main non-financial corporations sat and they were able to, the, the fact that they're sitting on bank boards allowed them to see the, uh, the system as a whole and it helped provide an integrating uh, orientation for them. So the argument is that the consequence of these three forces led the American business community in those days to operate in a relatively pragmatic manner. And one of the things that this meant was that they sometimes supported tax increases even on themselves, like to play for war. So the Korean War <laughs> tax increase, well, when Eisenhower was proposing that, first of all, the CED basically came up with the idea about how much Eisenhower was going to tax them. Even the more conservative business organizations, the National Association of Manufacturers and the Chamber of Commerce, acknowledged that, that yes, we have to pay more taxes. They just argued we shouldn't have to pay as much more. So this is, this is where things stood as of the early 1970s. Okay? And then, so it's actually, look, there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the 60s that we all know about, and they're all bunch of the bad things happening before that that we talked about before. But there were a number of ways in which the system was working quite well. The parties actually did things together. Um, the poverty rate was cut in half between 1960 and 1970. The median standard of living for the average American more than doubled during this period, and this is taking into account inflation. This was, there were a lot of things about that period that worked pretty well. And then it all starts to fall apart fall apart during the 1970s. What happens? Well, a whole confluence of events. First of all, in the 60s, Lyndon Johnson instituted an, an ambitious series of social programs, Medicare um, and Head Start and all kinds of other things that, that cost money and the economy was booming so we could afford it. But then we got bogged down in the Vietnam War and the combination of ambitious social programs and spending for the war created inflationary pressure. The other thing was that the labor market was so tight during that time that workers be actually became empowered and were able to push for higher wages. And all these things together created an inflationary spiral that started to hit in the 1970s. The second thing was, and all these things are interconnected too, 
The U.S. had come out of World War II as the world's dominant economic power. But um, part of what happened, and, and so one reason the American economy performed so well is that we really didn't face any competition. But by the early 1970s, Germany had started to catch up and Japan. And now these countries were producing higher quality goods at lower cost. And they started to flood the American market, and so people were not. And the, meanwhile, the American companies had been in these highly concentrated industries where they didn't have to innovate because they were facing no market pressure. And so they'd gotten soft. And all of a sudden, the, the auto companies, you know, they built their cars to fall apart deliberately every three years. And now we're facing competition from Japanese and Europeans producing really high quality cars that don't fall apart. And so the American companies started running into a lot of trouble. Then we had the energy crisis, first the doubling of the price of oil in 1973. This throws the economy into a recession and increases inflation. So now we have the simultaneous presence of high inflation and high unemployment, something that according to Keynesian economics shouldn't occur. Meanwhile, we had the turmoil of the 60s and then the Watergate scandal in the 70s, and this led to a decline in the legitimacy of major societal institutions, including business. And then also we had the emergence of these regulatory agencies, some of which had become somewhat aggressive in um, monitoring business, and business which had been relatively accepting of regulation started to feel threatened. And so all of these ki things coming together, the heads of large American corporations start to reassess their moderate positions and start thinking, you know what, maybe we're now under threat and maybe we no longer have the luxury of sitting back and being liberals. So they mounted a counteroffensive. Now the big, the key thing to understand here is that prior to this, the leaders of American big business wanted nothing to do with traditional conservatives. So and these people were considered, it was like Eisenhower, you know, these people are crackpots, they're the lunatic fringe, they're stupid, and in fact, Major business organizations like National Association of Manufacturers and Chamber of Commerce, even though they were big, they were seen as outside the realm of legitimate political discourse in that era. And so they really had no power, whereas the CED, which was more moderate, was very powerful because it was right in the middle politically. So, um, but what happened in the 70s is that big business seeing itself under threat made this fateful decision to align themselves with traditional conservatives. And this meant um, funding older agencies like the American Enterprise Institute and funding new ones like the Heritage Foundation and, and becoming much more aggressive in terms of attacking government regulation, starting to ask the question, wait a minute, whoever said we had to have labor unions? Maybe we can get rid of them. And becoming much more aggressive fighting labor unions, pressing for lower taxes. So in the late 1970s, we have a Democratic president, Democratic control of both houses of Congress, and the liberals aren't able to get anything accomplished. They can't get the Consumer Protection Agency uh, established. The labor movement can't get uh, labor law protection. It's just a period where, you know, there should have been sweeping liberal gains and in fact, in, if anything, there's retraction. What had happened was there was a, the entire business community had basically come together to fight back. And by the, and this is all before Ronald Reagan got elected. So Reagan gets elected at the end of 1980, he comes in in 1981, and at this point, basically, American business had gotten everything it wanted. In fact, at that, by then, the Democrats and the Republicans were competing in Congress to see who could give more breaks to big business, and they were giving them things that the, the companies weren't even asking for. It was beyond that. So, so basically, they had won everything. They'd gotten everything they wanted. The government had been completely delegitimized. The labor movement had been crushed. Um, there was nothing really left to fight for. There was, it was over, we won. And so what starts to happen is you start to see the, the big businesses start to become slowly fragmenting. They start going their own way. They don't have to be organized anymore. Um, I'm gonna get back to that in a second. But another, a third thing that happened, so there were these three sources of constraint, the government, labor, and the banks. Well, they'd wiped out two of them, the government and labor. And then as Jerry Davis and I have shown in a 
paper some years ago, you start to see the decline of the big commercial banks. I'm not going to go into the whole story here. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards if you're interested. But the banks basically abdicate their role as the arbiters of inter-industry disputes. They're no longer playing this role, so we lose this integrating force. And what we end up with is this situation. You start to see this in 1982 and 1983 after um, there were questions about Reagan had instituted these big tax cuts and driven up the deficit and everyone, including Reagan, knew there had to be a tax increase. And the question was, who's going to pay this tax increase? And you see these companies fighting with each other about who's going to do it. And then you can really see this with the 1986 tax bill, which was widely considered a loss for business to a great extent because they couldn't get their act together and, and operate in a more unified fashion. So this is happening during the 80s. And then the coup de grace in the late 1980s, a massive takeover wave of historic proportions. There had been major acquisition waves in American history, but nothing like what we saw in the late 1980s. After almost a century of intense stability, one third of the Fortune 500 disappears in that one decade, the majority of them through hostile takeovers. So and one consequence of that is the CEO tenure starts to decline. So uh, between 1980 and the early 2000s, there was a 25% decline in the tenure of uh, corporate chief executives um, during that period. So uh, anyway, think about it for a second. You're a CEO, and um, you know back in the old days, you had a lot of, you know maybe, OK, you're dealing with the labor movement. You're dealing with government. But you've got a lot of security. You don't have your stockholders pushing you, breathing down your back. And so you can think about the long-term implications of your decisions for the company and even for the larger society. Now, in the late 80s, you can't do that anymore. You think about long-term implications, why bother? You know, you could be out of a job next month because your company's been taken over. And so the orientation starts to change. And the argument that I make is by the end of the 1980s into the early 1990s, this fragmentation had um, expanded, increased. And because of the pressures that the CEOs were now facing, they're now, um, you're not seeing this kind of coordinated action that we had seen before. And I'm going to illustrate this with a couple of examples. The first one is tax policy. So I've already mentioned that there were multiple situations in which companies were willing to advocate for tax increases, partly because they, they didn't like deficits. And so, OK, there's a budget deficit. We've got to do something about this. These, were often, these often happened during wars. And they understood, well, you know, we have to pay. We're profiting from the war. We have to pay for some of this. But um, so this happened during the Korean War. It happened during the Vietnam War. Uh, and it even happened in the early 1980s. So what happened, so Reagan institutes these huge tax cuts. He runs up these, you know, it's supposed to pay, they're supposed to pay for themselves. They don't. They run up these huge deficits. Everyone understands we have to have a tax increase. And then there's this big fight. And the fight is, Reagan wants the tax increases to be on business. And the business roundtable wants the tax increases to be on individuals. Now think about this for a second. They're both fighting, but the, the individuals are them, right? Because now maybe CEOs in the early 80s didn't make nearly the amount of money that they make today. They didn't. But they were still near the top of the income distribution. And what they're basically saying is, no, don't tax our companies. Tax us individually. And this is in the early 80s. Well, as it turned out, um, that didn't happen. But the point is they were willing to advocate tax increases basically on themselves as individuals. OK, so now we fast forward 20 years. George W. Bush is president. And he again institutes these big tax cuts. Again, they, base, they overwhelmingly benefit the wealthy. It has to do with the fact that if everyone drops at an equal rate, if your rate is already higher, you're going to make more as a result of that. We end up with these huge deficits. So in 2004, so the Business Roundtable, which is the kind of a successor to the CED, although it's a different kind of organization, they're the leading organization of Fortune 500 chief executives. But so periodically, I guess um, their president would give talks in local communities. And um, 
I guess uh, the president at the time, John Castellani, was giving a talk at the Detroit Economic Club. And so the organization identified some local academics and invited them to this talk. So I guess they found I was interested in business, so they invited me. So uh, Jerry Davis and I drove out there. It was in Troy. And it was a great speech. The guy was funny, and he was, it was all about outsourcing, why outsourcing is a good thing. And somewhere in the middle of the speech, he starts talking about the deficit. And he's going on and on about how terrible the deficit is. But what was interesting, this is in 2004, there was not one word about the Bush tax cuts having anything to do with the deficit. And I found that really interesting. And it's also it's part of what led me to, to, to write this book, because I was like, why, did, why isn't he saying anything about the tax cuts? Well, you know, I never did quite find out the answer. I think it had to do with the fact that, that Bush made a deal with them where he said, you support me on this, I'll support you later on, which he did. He kept his word. But I found it interesting that an organization that had been willing to advocate tax increases for the purpose of reducing the deficit was suddenly just silent on it. And I don't know why, but it's, uh, it's seemed that there was a lack of willingness there for the group to step up and take a stand. By the way, the CED, which was still around at the time, came out and said, yes, we need a tax increase. But by that time, the organization was so irrelevant that nobody was paying attention. Um, so that's one example. But the other thing I want to talk about is health care. So I have one thing up here, $600 billion. That is my estimate. I estimated, based on actual data, uh, that in 2009, the 500 largest companies, according to Fortune, paid about $375 billion for health care for their employees. I had real data for that one. This one I extrapolated by taking, well, what is, have the increases in health care costs been since 2009? I came up with their paying, and even if you take into account that maybe they've pushed some of those costs onto their employees, I'm figuring about $600 billion, which is an average of more than a billion dollars per company, which gives you an idea of why big businesses in the United States might be concerned about health care. And in the late 1980s, they were. Health care costs were going through the roof, and they were really getting concerned to the point that significant numbers of them were saying, you know, maybe we just need the government to come in and take over the health care system. So Bill Clinton gets elected, and he has this health care plan, and the Business Roundtable supported it. The National Association of Manufacturers supported it. The Chamber of Commerce supported it. One business leader I spoke with, uh, whose name I will protect, told me that he was at a speech that Hillary gave to leading corporate executives and that she, quote, had them eating out of her hand. They wanted this thing. And yet, somehow it didn't happen. Well, what happened was the Republicans, a group of Republicans in Congress, led by an upstart, a young um, promising upstart named John Boehner, basically threatened the heads of these companies saying, you know, if you guys go along with this, we're going to slap you with new regulations. And, and they intimidated them, and the business people backed off. They got cold feet, and they dropped their support. Now, this is, something like this is unthinkable 30 years earlier. In the 1950s, the, they, the politicians would have been trembling at the, with the, the business people. Now things are switched, and I, I suspect this is part of what I'm talking about. They're now fragmented, they're weak, they, they can't get together and push for something successfully, and now you know, their costs are through the roof. One question that seems like a legitimate one is, why don't they support single payer? They supported Social Security, as it turned out, because they figured out, gee, we don't have to pay these pensions. In fact, when Social Security was instituted, a lot of American companies actually reduced the pensions they were paying to their workers by exactly the amount that Social Security was paying. Well, I mean, it seems to make logical sense. All of their competitors in these other countries aren't paying, you know, the cost would not be zero if we had single payer, but you could see it would clearly be in their economic interest to do it. They're, they're, partly it's they're too weak and partly they're ideologically blind. And we actually, a student and, and I conducted some interviews, and it turns out actually some of the CEOs do favor single payer. They don't say it publicly, but they think it would be a good idea. Anyway, these are just examples of what I'm talking about today. So what I argue is today's corporate elite is disorganized and ineffectual. And I know what some of you are thinking. Are you kidding? They just got the biggest tax cut for themselves in world history. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. I've still got a few minutes. What I argue is when it comes to gaining favors for themselves, 
that their lobbyists take care of, they're still extremely successful. If you think about political power in that way, one could make a good case that big business is as powerful today as it has been since the 1920s. So I'm not denying that. But when it comes to issues that require them to act collectively, I would argue that they in fact have been extremely unsuccessful. Even though it seems like they might be getting some things now, they haven't solved the health care problem, they're still waiting on immigration, uh, the infrastructure again, we'll see what happens with that. They haven't been able to get a gas tax for the highway trust fund. Trade, which was one thing they had been successful on, they managed to get NAFTA, now even that's in doubt. Okay, we do have this tax reform thing. I've been, you know, I've been reading a lot about that, and I am not convinced. Right now, at this moment, they seem to be pretty happy with the tax cut. But if you look at where most of the big companies were in the period leading up to it, you, didn't see, you actually did not see a whole lot of support. There was a lot of ambivalence. It's within the past couple of years that some of the big business people were actually pleading with the government to increase their taxes because they were concerned about the deficit. So I don't think they're crying and making a fuss and really, really upset that they just got this big tax cut. But you, you, many of you know about the Cone episode at that Wall Street Journal Council meeting where he asked people how many of you are going to invest all this money that you save and like two hands went up and they didn't know what it was about. Okay, so what's going on here and what does this have to do with this political extremism that I was talking about earlier? Well, here's what I'm going to argue. What I suggest is that in this post-war period, elite American corporations, they weren't, look, they were still on the conservative side of the spectrum, but they were close to the middle. They really occupied something close to the center of American politics. And not only that, again, they wanted no part of these traditional conservatives. You read CED documents from that period, they talk about, we're trying to rescue the business community from this antiquated Neanderthal, they actually use the word, um, laissez-faire thinking. They have to understand that the government has to play a significant role in the economy and it has to, again, moderate and uh, ameliorate the effects of the market system. But in the 1970s, as I've already described, they basically, now I can say it here because I'm not for public, well, it's sort of for public consumption. Maybe we can edit it out. So the term I sometimes <laughs> use here is they made a pact with the devil. And you know what happens when you make a pact with the devil. Eventually, you, it's also the other, the other metaphor I use is they created Frankenstein's monster. You know, they, they, it worked. I mean, it was a good idea to align themselves with the traditional conservatives because they got everything they wanted. But then the, the conservatives got so powerful in this movement that as the business community fragmented and, and became less powerful, they uh, had created this, this wave that they no longer could control. So, you know, the Tea Party emerged in, in uh, 2009, and now it's called the Freedom Caucus, and people think, oh, it's this new thing that these, these newly conservative people. This group has always been around. This is the group of people, first of all, this is the group Eisenhower was referring to. The only thing he was incorrect about is calling them really tiny. They were never that tiny. This is the group that managed in their one moment of glory in that period, they got Barry Goldwater nominated for the Republican, um, as the Republican presidential candidate in 1964, which led to a huge exodus of big business people from the Republican Party. They went and supported Lyndon Johnson. Goldwater was swamped in a historic landslide defeat. But those people were there. Those are the people who are the Tea Party. But in those days, they were seen as Again, maybe edit this out, but they were kind of seen as a lunatic fringe. These people were crazy. These are not, I mean, these ideas were nuts, were considered just completely outside the realm of acceptable political discourse. Now they're mainstream. They've basically been adopted by one of our two major political parties. And what I argue is that basically the corporate elite lost control of the Republican Party in the early 1990s. You see, even in that period, there's a uh, cover story in Fortune magazine with a picture of an elephant and you know what happened, why big business lost control. A lot of articles in the last few years, um, including several that I'm quoted in, talking about how big business lost Washington. Again, think, you know, there does seem to be some indication that they might be 
having a bit of a comeback right now because things seem to be going their way. But I suspect that if we look at what's really behind this, it's more driven by Republicans and politics than it is by big business people actually pushing for these things. And as evidence of their ineffectuality, um, there is not a single top 100 U.S. chief executive who wanted Donald Trump to be president. Um, it's just difficult. It's hard to know, but if this were 1957, I cannot imagine that um, somebody like Trump could have gotten. They, they would have nominated Jeb in 1957. I know I'm out of time, right? So let me conclude. I don't want to romanticize the past. There were plenty of things really, really bad about the 1950s and 60s. I'm much happier to be here now. I suspect many of you are as well. But there were some really good things about that period too. You know, again, these corporate elites of those days, they were not altruists, but at least they had a sense that you had to, you know, you had to have some sense of responsibility. You can't just plunder. You can't hoard all the resources for yourselves. Today they're facing different kinds of pressures, which I've already alluded to. And I could get in if I had a little more time, I'd talk to talk about, you know, the structural forces that have created the situation as well as the fact that even some of my colleagues in sociology will find it hard to believe that I'm even using cultural as anything other than a pejorative. But actually, <laughs> I think there is a cultural component to this. These are the, the people of that era were the ones who lived through the Depression. They, they lived through World War II. Many of them served in government during World War II. They really did have a different mentality from the ones today. Um, there is plenty of corporate responsibility. There are people like Warren Buffett and Howard Schultz, the Starbucks CEO, who do all kinds of really good things. But it's all piecemeal. Oh, this private initiative, that private initiative. None of it is translating over to actual policy. Richard Lockman, a uh, sociologist, I think this is actually the title of his new book, but he has a great phrase. He's looked at the decline of several empires, dating back to the Romans. And what he argues is the single distinguishing characteristic of them is when the elite starts to hoard all the resources for itself. And he talks about, you know, in the United States, if things continue to go where they are, the elite's going to end up being first class passengers on a sinking ship. I think it's a great phrase and good place to end, so I'll stop. <laughs> Can I stay up here? Okay. So we have, uh, we have about we have about 15 minutes uh, uh, for questions, and I'm actually going to pose the first one. So that, in, in many ways, is a very bleak story. Um, do you see any uh, political opportunities for a, for, for a political group or a policy entrepreneur to be able to reverse this trend and to get, uh, to get our business community to be thinking together about important issues of the day? Yeah. <clears throat> OK, so the, the if my theory is correct, and I didn't, this will actually speak to the third bullet point here. The only thing that could really get that to happen is a resurgence of mass social movements. The environmental movement has to be strong enough to, to really push. There's got to be a resurgence of the labor movement. These are the forces, well, the environmental movement was later, but these were the kinds of forces that led them to be more moderate in the first place. So that's the theory. On the other hand, and you know, there, there are there are some reasons to be optimistic. It, you know, there are pockets of movements happening. There are groups getting, uh, becoming active in corporations and getting the corporations to behave differently. But one reason, so one of the things I did in the conclusion of the book is I actually, I made an, I, I said, you know, we're in real danger now. There's global warming. The world could be become uninhabitable in a matter of decades or sooner. And this is, you know, it's very nice to say, well, we need social movements to do something about this. But I don't know if there's time for that. So I don't know what to do at this point other than to make an, an appeal to these people. Like, come on, you guys. You know, these are your kids and we're going to have to deal with the situation. So I end the book with this kind of moral appeal. You know, they have to get their act together and, and realize that they're the ones who have the power to do something about it. And there are into plenty of individuals who understand this, but there's no organized force. So I don't think there is a lot of reason to be optimistic. By the way, I was savaged for that conclusion, which basically did contradict the theory of the book, but I didn't know where, what else to say. It was just I tried to make this appeal. And um, I really think that that's, this, I don't know how to do it 
other, but I do know that there are people out there in the corporate world who do understand these things and would like to do something about it. It's just that there's also, there are forces like the Koch brothers who have a lot more power now than they did in those days. Arnold. The question is sort of a follow-up to that. I'm wondering if the economic conditions today would have sort of support the lay economic theory that allowed them to be successful back in the 50s. Um, yeah, so you could make a case, so here's, here's how I see the, the, the economic piece of it. I think in the 50s, not only did they, were they Keynesians economically, but they were right to be Keynesians because <coughs> there, there was enormous productive capacity, there, was, there were huge, you know, productivity was really high, uh, supply was really high, and the problem was how do you get people to buy all this stuff that's being produced? If you don't, we're going to end up back in the Great Depression. And so there was an understanding, well, we've got to put money in people's pockets. That means relatively high wages. We've got to have welfare payments and, and other kinds, increased Social Security payments. In the 70s, and I, I, some people are not going to like this part of it, but Labor got really, um, they got to a point in the late 60s where they really had a lot of clout. The labor market was so tight that I, there are stories about, you know, they'd go to one construction firm and the guys would say, uh, we're only giving you this much. And the guy would say, I, the workers say, I can get 10% more across the street. Screw you. And they'd walk across the street and get it. That was one reason the Business Roundtable was founded, by the way. So, you know, there were these Marxist economists who wrote about the profit squeeze. That's what they were talking about. Labor was actually starting to, to get a bigger piece of the pie at that point. Meanwhile, productivity was not growing. So what you start to see is in the 70s, uh, the, the Keynesian argument doesn't seem to hold as well. And I, I think the supply siders, the supply side argument about you cut taxes, it's going to increase revenue, that really is crackpot. But there's a piece of the supply side argument that I think actually there's something too. And that's the idea that one of the reasons there was so much inflation in the 70s was because productivity had dropped and supply really was lower and wages were high and that created upward pressure on prices. And that's what a lot of these businesses were complaining about. So what they do, they went and smashed the labor movement and they, they were successful. Okay, so now, we've, now we move to today. The situation today, I would argue, is much more like the post-World War II period. So they were so successful in destroying the labor movement, so now you start to see compression, not compression, but decline or, or stagnation of wages for the bulk of the population. Huge increases at the top. I would argue, you know, I mean, I'm not an economist, and I don't know, you know, I haven't analyzed this carefully, but I would at least theorize that we've gone back to a situation where we need Keynesian policies, and that was one of the causes of the 2008 financial crisis. That now people don't have enough money in their pockets because wages have been um, reduced or held constant for so long. And so I actually think the economic conditions today, if the ideology were not so uh, backward, um, would, a would actually be consistent with what happened in the post war period. The difference is, you know, people aren't looking at it that way. Yes? A Century of War. Is that the book? Yes, this is it. A Century of War. It's a really wonderful compendium of documentation. Um, that, and, and, and the basic thrust of it is that we have been, the basic thrust of this is that we have been ignoring now altogether too long the tremendous, almost autonomous power of a very small number of very large banks. They were the ones who were in charge of directing the, the whole shape of investment uh, after um, World War I. And uh, this is just massive. All right, but uh, if, if we could start at one particular point here uh, so as not to get lost, I, I, I would say the, the, the Marshall Plan, the vaunted Marshall Plan resulted in a great deal of money being made by the same dudes who, who were given practically a monopoly in, in financing the British uh, World War I defense. Uh, they stayed in power. Now, after 
So after making all this money, because the, the government, our government was guaranteeing their loans, instead of uh, reinvesting a substantial portion of that into the American economy, the American economy was allowed to fall into disrepair vis-a-vis -vis the Germans and the French and everybody in Italy, I mean in, in Europe, even Italy, that's another surprising story. Uh, so, the, so the same banks continued to invest in Europe because that was gravy. Instead of having this, this, this serious long-term investment that you need to get something really going that's really needing a lot of help. Um, that you, 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 you didn't get that. Now look, if we suppose, I mean, so that meant that the American labor force was not invested in also. That conditioned everything. So by the time you got to having to defend the dollar because of the Vietnam War in addition to Johnson's programs, then drastic askings were taken by the Builder Group, and that's not just a right-wing shibboleth, although it's been represented that way. And, the, um, uh, and then, of course, the, the change in the name in 1973. And the mechanism there was to drive up was to use the increase in, 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 in oil prices, you know, the petrodollar, in order to stave uh, off the, 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 the fall of the dollar. And what that meant was that we were going to tax the whole world because of our power to do so. Okay, so can, I, can I just... Is that all right? I want to make sure that other people right. have a chance. But let me just yeah. speak, say one thing in response to that. What I, what I hear you getting to is one issue that I constantly get asked about, and that is what role did globalization play in all this? And the answer is, it definitely played a role. I mean, you know, because one response is, well, why don't American elites care about American society anymore? And, well, who cares if American kids can't read? The Chinese can, we'll just invest over there. I think that, I, I definitely think there's something to that. On the other hand, if you look at what they did in Western Europe when when their, their globalization increased, they actually increased the social safety net. I still think it's a domestic political issue. Well, we so, devastated Mexico. We devastated this. Oh, we devastated large parts of the world. I mean, it's not just and so. Republican knows that it was never the case that, that, that the Mexican society inherently was unproductive. If, in fact, when this regime to support the dollar, You know, I, I, I really don't want to interrupt you, but uh, there are a bunch of other people, and I, um, we can talk about this later. Yeah, Sylvia? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want you to know that I actually knew Robert um, Cooley Angel, and I was his research assistant. <laughs> I was very, very young, but he had a project which was called Sociology for the High Schools, creating sociology materials for high school students. And he and his team thought it would be a good idea to ask an undergraduate to go to the library and bring books, not only the books that they asked me to bring, which of course I brought, but to sort of let my eye roam over that section of books and see if something caught my eye. So I did that for that project for a while. So I, you have a little bit of the spirit of Robert Angel here too. Um, I wanted to t say something about your talk, which I found really enlightening. Uh, it has explained to me why it is that we never, don't any longer have people like Nelson Rockefeller, you know, that uh, was in many ways an admirable person. Um, but I th with respect to your question of what will bring these folks together again, I think what will bring them together again is their realization that they have an enlightened self-interest, you know, back to your point. Well, if, uh, if they... <laughs> no, but they do. Yeah. But, and I'll tell you an example of that. I recently uh, went to a talk on climate change, actually at my church, not at the university. Uh, but the presenter was very good, and he presented some data on the fact that what will make a difference is if the auto industry, for example, can develop the electric car, 100% electric, and that that will bring down the carbon emissions, yeah. and it is the only thing that will bring down the carbon emissions that drive climate change, yeah. uh, uh, global warming. Uh, so I think if, you know, their enlightened self-interest is in fact in developing those cars and they are racing to do so. Yeah, I, I agree that there certainly is enough happening in the market that at least gives me some optimism. On the other hand, you know, when you have an administration that's going to yeah. tax solar energy and, and then uh, subsidize fossil fuels. <laughs> but, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's some reason for optimism. I don't want to sound you know, overly depressed about this. One more? One. Very quickly. Yeah, well, I mean, if I, I wish I could predict the future. I have no idea. But what I will say is that certainly the long-term trajectory, you have to be a little careful. You know, in the 80s, we thought, oh, Japan is wiping us out, and then Japan imploded later. And now some of us are thinking, oh, China's going to wipe us out. We don't really know. So I don't, I'm not about to write the death warrant of the United States yet. But if you look at the long-term trajectory of the country and what's happening to our military uh, clout right now and our ability to... To, uh, to just project certain authority in the world, I really do see a long-term decline. And, you know, I, I see us going the way of the British. Uh, that's the, if you ask me to predict, that's what I would say. Is that it? Well, Mark, uh, thank you uh, for a terrific and depressing talk. <laughs> um, uh, I'm uh, really grateful for the work. And behalf on all of your colleagues uh, in the oh, college, wow. I'd like to present you uh, this small uh, me uh, memento of uh, this afternoon's talk. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, please join me in thanking Mark, and let's uh, gather for a reception at the back of the hall. Thank you. Thank you.